here this morning. If you'll please grab your hymnals and, and stand with me. We are going to sing song 636, Revive Us Again. 636, Revive Us Again. And um, praise the Lord, we have a pianist this morning. Amen? <laughs> All right. Uh, 636, Revive Us Again. Uh, we're going to do all four verses. Here we go. We... You want to do an intro? Yeah. All right, do it. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for this morning you've given to us. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we ask that you will be every aspect of the service this morning, the piano playing, the singing, and then be with Brother Seth Armstrong as he'll be bringing our message this morning. And Father, we just ask that if there's anyone in this room this morning or anybody watching online who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, we'll ask that they will come to know what that means to have a personal relationship with you in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. That was wonderful singing. And I think the best part is we had someone playing piano along with us. Amen. Man, that was, uh, last week will go down as a great memory, won't it? <laughs> All right. Um, so some announcements this morning I'd just like to share with you. Um, uh, Brother Armstrong will be preaching today. Uh, we appreciate his help. Uh, during this time without a pastor as we continue to look for a pastor he does come here time to time he teaches uh, in our school and then he also assists his uh, father with the Spanish ministry uh, there in Antioch and we're also thankful for his sister Lydia for playing the piano today thank you so much and we so appreciate you taking time to to help us with that and, um, you know, we just uh, need to continue to, to pray for the Spanish ministry as well. They are doing a wonderful work. They're seeing people saved. They're seeing people baptized. And so we just continue for the Lord's blessing there. Um, I want to just uh, take a moment and just, again, thank everybody who has been working on the landscape and with the projects around the church. Um, you know, I was uh, speaking with, with Lynn this morning and, you know, our, our, the way our property looks on the outside is 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 a testimony and you know we just want to have that first good impression that first good testimony and so we appreciate all those that are helping and we just ask that um, if you're able to help just let us know and we'll find something for you to do but there's plenty of work to do here and then um, if you missed last week um, I just want to remind you that brother Dave Barber will be our interim pastor um, 
We started in September. Uh, him and his wife, as I mentioned before, they travel to the United States and their ministry is to go to churches and to help them. Sometimes he'll go to a church that is just getting started. Um, and so he will help build up um, excitement and, and visits and contacts leading up to that opening day of, of churches that are starting. Other things he does is he will uh, go to churches that may be struggling and, and help with assistance and, and um, getting new folks in and, and visitation and stuff like that. And so um, he has graciously said, hey, I will come in, in from September to December, I will uh, intern uh, pastorship here. And we're very grateful for that because number one, he knows our ministry. We've been associated with them for almost 20 years. And so we're excited to help him. Uh, we're excited to have him here. Um, on the, um, we don't have a bulletin here, but last week, his website is um, ipresson.com if you want more about him. And so we're excited to, uh, to have him here. And then I just also want to remind you that um, last week we finished our Sunday School series on the book, Gentle and Lonely, The Heart of Christ. Um, there's two copies left in the foyer. They're free, okay? So I promise if you take it, the sensor will not go off at the door, okay? Uh, it's, it's free, it's yours. It's a great read. Um, the chapters are short. That's what I like about this book. You know, you start and as, long, as, long as, as soon as you get into the chapter, it's over. And so it's a great book, and we just finished that. And then in Sunday School, um, now we're starting a new series um, called um, uh, the, the Dead Sea Rules. And the message behind that book is where the Lord leads you, he's going to lead you out. And so we, we, we talked about that this morning, and, and uh, I want to just invite you to come to Sunday School. It starts at 930 to be a part of that. All right. So let's uh, let's grab our hymnals and let's turn to our next song, song uh, Jesus Saves, it's 342, 342 Jesus Saves, and um, we will uh, sing all four stanzas of Jesus Saves. scripture reading our scripture verse for this month is joshua chapter 1 verses 8 through 9 
And so we are going to go ahead and say that uh, together as a church congregation. Uh, we're going to read through it three times, um, and we'll say the text, then read through the verses. That'll be one, and then we'll start again, read the text, and then say the verses. Um, if you, um, in your in the uh, seat in front of you, there should be a card or um, around, so hopefully you will see that, and so you can read along. I also want to just remind you that, I should I want to say this in announcements, but hey, it's, it's a great time right now with the scripture. We have these cards in the back. It says uh, Joshua 1, 8 through 9 with our scriptures for the month. And uh, if you don't, haven't grabbed one, we just ask one per family, please grab it and, uh, and take it to your house, put it on the fridge, on the coffee table, um, wherever you, know, you frequent a lot, um, so that you see it and you think about those verses um, for this month. And the goal is to, to memorize them before the end of the month. But as a church, we want to focus on these verses this month. So let's uh, let's do our scripture reading. Ready? Joshua 1, 8 through 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have not I commanded you be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. All right. Joshua 1, 8 through 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but ye shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And for the third and final time, Joshua 1, 8 through 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but ye shall meditate in it day and night, that ye may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this is God's word. Thank you. All right, for our third song today, we're going to turn to 663, um, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, 663. Give you a moment to... Come here. <laughs>
to the um, time where our offering um, I just uh, want to just encourage you all to just continue being faithful um, in your tithes and offerings the Lord is continuing to bless in, in ways that um, only he can bless and it's through the faithfulness of, of you here and I you know I, I thank you for that but more than that um, there are just blessings that the Lord has for you in this area as you continue to be faithful. Um, I just want to remind you that um, we do have, uh, you can um, give online through our website, or you can give through the blue box that's in the back. Um, either way, we just uh, thank you for your faithfulness in, in this area. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time and Lord, where we just uh, take a moment to talk about giving, and Lord, just the blessings that you have for us in this area. I just pray that we will just continue to be faithful and just continue to do as you have led us, Lord, and just to realize the importance of trust you in this area. We thank you now for all this in your name. Amen. Amen. this for a lot. I, I think it's uh, because of um, COVID we had stopped doing this, but um, don't necessarily need to um, shake hands or anything, but what I'd like to do is, um, Lydia, if you could play our next hymn, uh, 472, just play some music. But what I'd like everybody to do at the moment when Lydia starts playing is I'd like you to get up and I want you to go see someone that you do not know, introduce yourself to them, and then uh, maybe ask them for a loan. No, just joking. But, but, <laughs> but let's take a moment and, and let's just greet one another, say hi to someone that you're not, you don't know, get to know their name, and we'll do that for a bit, and then we'll go into our last song, and then Brother Armstrong will come up and preach. So um, as soon as she starts playing, here we go. All right. Thank you. 
All right, as Miss Lydia plays the last uh, one more stanza that we can make our way back to your seats, and we'll grab our hymnals and turn to Psalm 472, My Jesus I Love Thee. Turn to page 472. We're going to sing the first, the second, the last stanza of My Jesus, I Love Thee. And when we start playing, if there's anyone who's in junior church, um, if you would, dis uh, when we start uh, singing, if you would dismiss your children to junior church, my wife will be uh, handling junior church today, and that would be awesome. All right. So let's uh, do 472, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Seth Armstrong um, will be bringing our message this morning. So at this time, Brother Armstrong, if you'd come and give us the message this morning, sir. Good morning. It's a blessing to be with you all again this morning. If you would take your Bibles this morning and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Go ahead and pray, uh, and then we'll take a look uh, at this passage this morning. Second Timothy chapter one. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and really focus on what is most important in life. There are a lot of important things in life, and uh, there are a lot of things going on, I'm sure, in each one of our lives. But there is only one thing that is the most important. And that is you. You are our creator. You are our God. You are the one that sustains our life every moment of every day. You are our only hope, both for this life and the life to come. Father, I pray that you might really work in each heart and each life this morning. I pray that if there is anyone here this morning that is still living apart from you, uh, that has not yet turn to you alone uh, as their Savior and King, that this morning 
might work in your heart by your spirit to do that. Father, we pray that you might prepare me as I seek to share your word. It's so easy many times for us as preachers to share our own thoughts and our own opinions, but I pray that you might keep me from doing that this morning. I pray that my heart might be directed this morning by your word. I pray that each one here might be able to follow along in their own Bibles and uh, make sure that what I say this morning is not just my own thoughts and opinions, but is actually from your word. And I pray that if there's anything that I say this morning that doesn't come from your word, that they might reject it. And that they might realize that the only source of ultimate truth uh, is you. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the wisdom and the power that it gives us. And dear Lord, I pray that this morning that you might empower me by your spirit uh, to share your word. And that each one of us might be encouraged and challenged as we continue to grow in you. And we pray this in Christ's name and for his glory. A little while ago, um, I read a book about a um, a really special dog. Uh, this dog's name was Judy. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She was the only dog that was an official prisoner of war. So there were many dogs that have helped out in many of the wars throughout the years. Uh, but as far as the records go, she was the only dog that was an official prisoner of war. And she was participated in the Second World War in the Pacific. Uh, she was actually a kind of like a mascot on one of the British ships. Uh, and she was, she started off on this British ship even before World War II started. Uh, she was actually born in China in a British compound there and then uh, was acquired by, a, by the British Navy. And uh, on that ship, she uh, was a huge help. She was able to warned the ship she had an uncanny ability to detect aircraft uh, that was coming so before even the radar picked it up or other things picked it up she started to bark and when she started to bark everyone knew that there was aircraft coming anyway she goes through this an incredible story uh, i encourage you guys to look into it if you ever have the chance incredible story about this dog who was um actually shipwrecked several times finally she was uh captured by the Japanese in the Second World War, along with her master uh, and some other people. She was transported to different locations, and then finally uh, she ended up in a Japanese prisoner of war camp where they were building a railroad for the Japanese with really, really difficult conditions. Uh, very, very, uh, many people actually starved in that camp. and. Um, miraculously, she was able to survive and she actually made friends with a lot of the prisoners there and was able to uh, give them hope and they actually shared some of their meager rations with her even when they were very close to dying because they cared so much about this dog. But this dog had learned through the uh, months of staying in this prisoner of war camp that, you, that she needed to stay very, very quiet. Uh, because the Japanese were constantly looking for, the guards there were constantly looking for a reason to kill her. So she constantly had to be quiet, kind of sneak around, find food, help out her friends, and then escape into the woods around there. And it, she, uh, the, the prisoners there said she almost never, ever, in the entire time she was there, she almost never, ever barked. Uh, almost never even made any noises knowing that it would cost her her life if she did. But one day, uh, the prisoners were all asleep, and all of a sudden, they heard Judy barking. And she wasn't just barking, she was running around the entire camp barking as loudly as they had ever heard her bark. Uh, and the person that was closer to her, his name was Frank Williams, he was kind of like her adopted master. And uh, when he heard the barking, he was scared to death because he thought, oh no, for sure they're going to kill her. Why is she barking so loudly? She knows that this is going to be so dangerous for her. So they, she, they run out and they, they grab a hold of Judy and like, stop barking, stop barking. But as they do that, they start to look around. And they notice that something was different. And what was different was that there was no guards in the camp. And then uh, they listened and they heard some approaching trucks and they realized that the reason why Judy was barking so loud is because the war was over. 
The uh, uh, British had come and then they were about ready to be rescued. The Japanese guards had fled and she was the first one to know about it and she could not keep quiet. She wanted everyone in the camp to know this amazing news that these months and months of incredible suffering were over and that they were finally free. And even though she had been quiet for so long, she could no longer start crying and she would stay quiet and she was proclaiming to all of the camp, we're free, we're free, we no longer have to suffer. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, that's exactly what Paul is telling Timothy to do. He's telling Timothy, look, you have the best news in the world. Just like Judy had some really good news that the war was over, that the, the prisoners were free, and she couldn't hold back telling it, Paul is telling Timothy, look, you have the best news in the world, and because of how important this news is, you cannot hold back from sharing that news. And really, that's the message that, that Paul has for us today. Since we have the greatest news that was ever told, how can we keep from sharing it? Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, and in verse 8, 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Paul, at this point in his uh, life, was about ready to die. He was a prisoner in Rome under the emperor Nero, and Nero, according to tradition, shortly after 2 Timothy was written, ended up beheading Paul. And Paul knows that it's the end of his life. If you read through the book of 2 Timothy, you'll notice he talks over and over again about finishing the course, about his sufferings, about how he's ready to face the Lord, knowing that it's at the end of his life. And he realizes that Timothy, having traveled with Timothy, he realizes that Timothy is naturally, it seems like, he's a little bit timid. Uh, and at times he can be a little bit uh, afraid of, of sharing this news, knowing what it will cost. Knowing that if it's about ready to cost Paul his life, Timothy has already seen how it has cost other people their lives, Paul being in prison at this time. And Timothy might have been a little bit tentative to share this good news with others, knowing that it would have been dangerous for him um, and, and very difficult. So that's why Paul writes them and says, don't be ashamed of this testimony, but be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So why is it so important that Timothy not be ashamed? Why is it so important that he share this gospel? That word gospel literally means good news. Um, and the Greek is made up of two words that literally mean good news. So why is it so important? What, is the, what are these good news? Well, in verse 9, he starts to tell us what these good news are and why it is so important that we share these good, this good news with others. So in verse 9, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So this morning I want to share with you just three different reasons why this news is so good. And the first one is very simple there. It's just those first four words of verse 9. It says, Who hath saved us? Who hath saved us? We have to realize that every single one of us, the Bible teaches, is a sinner. We're a sinner by birth. God says in, in Romans 5 that because of Adam's sin, Adam's sin has been passed down so that each one of us is born in sin. But also, every single one of us is a sinner by choice. Each person here, including me, at countless numbers of times in our lives, have decided to do what we know God does not want us to do. We know that God created us, that God has the right to tell us what to do, and yet we have decided, I don't want to do what God wants to do. I want to do what I want to do. And because of that, the Bible says in Romans 6 that all of us have become slaves of sin. Every single one of us has become slaves of sin, and that sin, even when we try to stop, we can't. And uh, in James 1, it says that that sin always results in death. 
and destruction. And we've all seen it in our lives. Every single one of us has experienced the pain, the guilt, the shame, and the destruction that sin brings. And all of us, I'm sure, have tried to change. We've tried to stop sinning. We've tried to maybe, for some of us, it's anger. And we, we, we think to ourselves, I can't get angry at my kids anymore. I can't get angry at my spouse or my parents or my siblings. Uh, every time I get angry, it just causes more and more problems and more and more destruction. And we've tried to stop, and as hard as we've tried, we, we can't do it. And it just keeps controlling us and destroying those around us. For some of us, it might be envy. And we see people at work or neighbors or family members that have uh, financial resources that we wish we had or that have relationships that we wish we had or, or that have health that we wish we had. And, and we become bitter and angry towards them because they have something we wanted. And we know it's destroying us. We know it's stealing all of our joy. We know it's destroying our relationship with that person. And we want to change, but we can't. For some of us, it's lust. For some of us, it's um, selfishness or pride that causes us to mistreat other people. But all of us have experienced that battle with sin, and all of us have seen that it is wrong. All of us have maybe even at different times in our life tried to change. All of us have known that that sin is destroying our hearts, our relationship with others. It's, it's corrupting us, and yet we can't change. We don't have the power to change. And like it says in Romans chapter 3, it says there in verse uh, 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of their way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And it finishes up that idea in verse 23 with a really well-known verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we have to realize all of us are sinners. And many of us, many of the world today, understand that and have tried to change and have failed to change and have lost hope. And there are many people in the world today that just give up hope. They say, I can't change. It's, it's useless. And they continue to destroy their relationships with their family, with their friends. They continue to be just to be eaten from the inside out with sin. And they know that one day they're going to have to stand in the presence of God and give an account. And they know that they're going to be found guilty. And they live a life filled with guilt and shame and sin. And they have no hope. But these four simple words change all of that. Who hath saved us? God came into this world to bring hope to the storm. And that's the first reason why we must share this message that is so incredible. It gives hope to the sinner. It tells us that no matter how far away you've gotten from God, no matter how many wrong, evil choices you have made that have brought so much sin and destruction and sadness into your life, no matter how many times you've tried to change and haven't been able to, there is hope. Not in yourself, because none of us can change ourselves. Not even the best of us can do anything to change our own hearts. But there is hope because of Jesus. There is salvation in Jesus. And that's why Romans 5 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There is hope in Christ. But it is only in Christ. It is not in a religion. It is not in another person. It's not in a self-help book. It's not in a, um, a government. The only hope we have to change our lives, to be free from sin, to be free from this, the, the punishment that we deserve, is Christ. Outside of him, there is no hope. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of Ernest Shackleton. Um, Marina Shackleton was a really famous explorer, explorer in the early 1900s uh, who did several different expeditions to Antarctica. At that point in time, no one had ever been able to explore Antarctica. And one of his, in one of his expeditions in the early 1900s, uh, he took a uh, boat and a well-equipped crew and went to Antarctica. And, and on their way there, they just got to the sea that's right on the coast of Antarctica and their ship was just completely surrounded by ice. 
uh, to the point where they could not move it at all. And finally, they had to abandon ship because the ice literally crushed their ship. They spent uh, a long period of time just on the ice floes surrounding Antarctica. Uh, most of them thought they were going to die. Uh, they did have three small lifeboats uh, that they basically carried with them trying to reach some type of land. There was a very small island called Elephant Island off of the coast of Antarctica. And through basically a lot of miracles, finally they were able to reach that small island called Elephant Island. Uh, but basically, Elephant Island is a glacier just completely covered with ice. They were just on this tiny little beach on um, Elephant Island, and they knew that uh, very few people ever got to that point, point. Um, and if they stayed there for too long, they would all die. So Shackleton, along with five others of the crew, decided to do what was really everyone thought was impossible, which was take this 20-foot lifeboat and take it through what is considered the most dangerous sea in the entire in the entire world, several hundred nautical miles, to a nearby island called South Georgia Island. Incredibly, they made it to the island. They left 22 of the crew on Elephant Island. Um, on that island, those 22 crew were basically running out of food. Um, they were facing a winter of incredible cold. Um, they just had these two small broken boats that they knew had no hope, help with saving them. And all they could do is sit there and wait and hope that Shackleton made it and that somehow a boat would be able to make it back to them and save them. After several months of waiting, miraculously Shackleton made it to the island, brought a boat back. And these men were on the point of death. They were very close to giving up and they see this boat coming in. And imagine if these 22 men sitting on Elephant Island with these two broken boats in the middle of a frozen desert with nothing, uh, no way of, of getting off that island except for this one boat. And that boat pulls up and they're like, nah, we're good. We're going to stay here. I'm a pretty good swimmer. I think I can make it to South America. You know, it's a little bit cold and chilly in these waters, but, but I think I can make it. All of us know that would have been the epitome of idiocracy. <laughs> no one can swim from Antarctica to South America. Uh, you will die, especially in their condition. That boat was their only hope. The only thing they could do is say, I have no power to get to save myself. Thank you so much for bringing this boat. I am getting on this boat. Yet so many people in the world today think they can face life by themselves. They think they can deal with their own sin by themselves. They think that they can be good enough to gain God's favor by themselves. In that same passage we just read in Romans chapter 3, it says very clearly there, by the law, no flesh shall be justified. It's impossible. It's like swimming from Antarctica to South America. You can't do it. The only hope that we have is Christ. And for those of us that know Christ, that's the only hope your friends and family, your co-workers, that's the only hope the world has. We live in a world that is dominated by sin. And the people in the world, when they are sincere, they know in their hearts that sin is destroying their lives. And they are hopeless. They try to change and they can't. And we have the boat, the only boat that can save them, the message of salvation, who hath saved us? The first reason we must share that is because it brings hope to the sinner. It brings hope to the sinner. Knowing our message, knowing the greatness of our message, how can we not share it? But not only does it bring hope for the sinner, if we continue reading to verse 9, it says, And called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. It says not only did, did Jesus save us from our hopelessness, from our condemnation, from our sin, from the, the sin that enslaves us and destroys us and condemns us, but he gave us a reason to live. He didn't just save us from those evil things and from that destruction, but that he gave us the ultimate reason to live. And it says he gave us that holy calling, not because we deserved it, not because we were great. 
but because his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Before he even created the world, he had a purpose for each one of us. And he not only wants to save us from the sin that's destroying us and condemning us and enslaving us, but he wants to give us the greatest purpose that we could ever have serving our creator. Completing literally the reason we were created for. Serving the one who made us, who had a purpose for us even before he created the world in Christ Jesus. Who has called us our king with a special holy some of you might have heard the story of King Arthur. Most people think it's kind of a mixture of a little tiny bit of truth with a whole lot of extra stuff added in over the years. Uh, but basically, this is the, the legend of King Arthur. The way the legend of King Arthur goes is that um, King Arthur was born the son of the king. Uh, but through some uh, different circumstances, uh, he was separated from the king and uh, grew up in the family of a rich ruler, uh, who uh, told him that he was the illegitimate son of Israel. So everyone around thought that he was just an illegitimate son. They treated him very poorly and did the most menial tasks. Um, uh, everyone thought he had no future, no purpose. Um, and then as he grew up, the, his father, not knowing that it was his father, his father, the king, died. And uh, there was no heir to the throne, so there, there was all this jockeying, all this fighting to figure out who would become king. And again, this is a legend, it's not, a, not necessarily a true story. Um, and so during this time, along comes this, this uh, guy named Merle. So I'm sure all of you heard Merle, maybe some of you have seen the old Disney movie, The Sword and the Stone. Uh, so the, the magician Merlin, uh, the wizard, he comes along, and he figures out a way to determine who is the legitimate heir to the throne. And so he takes a sword and he puts it in a stone and he says, the legitimate heir to the throne will be able to take this sword out of the stone. So all of these really strong, famous people come and try to pull it out and try to pull it out and, and no one can do it. Uh, no ruler, none of the most intelligent or most powerful people, uh, the most famous, no one can do it. And finally, it just kind of gets left to the side and, and uh, Several years pass. Finally, Arthur turns 16 and he's walking through the area where the, the sword and the stone is and he sees the, the sword. And uh, he, he realizes he needs a sword for something and he goes over and easily pulls it out. And everyone is amazed and, and he doesn't even know why. And he realizes that he, even though he thought his life was purposeless and meaningless, and he was just this illegitimate kid that had no future. He realized that the whole time he was actually the son of the king. And he actually has the most important purpose in the world of being the king of England. And he takes on that purpose. Many people like Arthur, Arthur are walking through their lives thinking that their life has no meaning, no purpose. Maybe some people today are even struggling with that and thinking, why do I exist? I feel like I don't have the talents or abilities of other people. I feel like uh, my relationships have fallen apart. I feel like I'm not able to accomplish what, what other people are able to accomplish. My life doesn't have meaning or purpose. But this isn't just for, for those people, everyone in the world. Even those people that are have accomplished great things, that have become CEOs of companies, or have been able to travel around the world and and have been able to solve humani great humanitarian crises or have been able to accomplish great things in sports or in politics. Even those people live their lives many times thinking, is, is this all there is? Does it, isn't there a greater reason for my life? And we have the best news not only because it gives hope to the sinner, but because it gives purpose to those who have no purpose. It gives us a reason to live. We exist because God in eternity past looked down through the ages and knew that you were going to be born, knew that I was going to be born, and called us and said, Seth, Joe, Janet, whatever your name is, he knew your name and he called you and he says, I want to use you to glorify my name. And he called us before the ages began and gave us a we have a reason to live. Our life is not meaningless. God created us, and he created us for a reason with a purpose. 
And that's what it's saying here in verse 9. It says, who hath saved us, not only does, does it give hope for the sinner, but it says he called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, not because we're great, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world. God gave us a purpose. And that's an incredible message. That's a message the world needs to hear. There is a reason why they are alive. They're not just here to make money. They're not just here to uh, advance some political cause. They're not just here even to raise a family. They're here for the greatest purpose that they could ever have, which is serving their king and creator, their God. We have a purpose. And then finally, because of this great message, we must share it because we have hope for the sinner. We have purpose for those who have no purpose. And then finally, verse 10, it says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Since through eternity past, God had a purpose for the world, God had a purpose for each one of us, but that purpose is worked out in time. And it says, at the perfect time, Galatians talks about, talks about how in God's perfect time, God sent Jesus to this, earth, to this earth, born of a virgin, born under the law, that he might save those of us who are condemned by the law. It says that purpose, verse 10, <clears throat> is now made manifest is now made manifest how by the appearing of our savior jesus christ he showed up at the exactly right time to actually put into uh, action the plan that god had and what did he do well he lived a perfect life he was born of a virgin he lived a perfect life he died in our place and on the third day he rose again to prove that he is God and to prove that death no longer has power over him. He has conquered death once and for all. That's what it says there at the end of verse 10. He hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through that same gospel. Every single one of us fears death. Even from the time that we were children, we, we have this innate fear of death. And we know that it's coming, but, but all of us are born of that fear of death. But through Christ, we no longer have to fear that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about how Jesus rose from the dead. At the beginning, it says that this isn't just a story. A lot of people think, oh, the resurrection is just a nice story, like uh, the superheroes or like fairy tales but paul says no this is an actual event that took place in history and to prove it at the beginning of chapter 15 he talks about all of these people that actually saw jesus he said 500 people at once saw him they touched him he really did physically rise from the dead it wasn't just a vision or a dream or a spiritual resurrection it was a physical resurrection that happened in time it is a real event. And because of that, we now have victory over death. And that's what it says in um, verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we fear death? 
We fear death as we know we have all sinned. And we know that when we die, we will have to stand before the ultimate judge of the universe, our creator, God. And we know that when we stand before him, like it says in, in Romans 3, every tongue will be stopped. We know that we won't be able to defend ourselves. We know that we can't say, oh God, yeah, I messed up a few, few times, but, but I was a good enough person for you to accept me, accept me. We know that God knows our hearts. He knows how sinful we are. And we know that when we stand before him, it's not going to be good. We are going to be condemned. But when Christ died on the cross in our place, and when he rose from the dead, it proved once and for all that God accepted his death and that all those who trust in him will be forgiven. That we will have Christ's righteousness as our own. And because of that, like it says here, the sting of death is sin. And it says the strength of sin is the law. It's the law saying you sinned, you deserve condemnation. But when Jesus took our sin on himself, it says in Corinthians that he became sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in him. When he did that for us, when we turn from our sins and say, I don't want that anymore, Jesus, please save me and change me. He gives the new heart, and it says in Romans 8, 1, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And because of that, we no longer fear death. Because now, like Paul says, instead of it being a moment when we face our judge and know we're going to be condemned, now to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that we have Christ's righteousness, Christ's forgiveness, so that that death no longer has sting. Instead, like it says here, he has abolished death. He's destroyed its power. And he has brought instead to light what is true life. Jesus says he came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And to give us eternal life and immortality so that, like it says in Revelation, one day we will be given a new body and live in a new heaven and a new earth. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And we will no longer have to fear being separated from our loved ones, being separated from God, and we will live forever with God. And that's the last reason why it's so important for us to share this message. Not only because it gives hope for the sinner, not only because it gives purpose to those who have no purpose, but finally because it gives life to those who are dead. Again, it says um, in, in Romans that all of us are dead. Ephesians 2 starts off saying, and we who are dead in our trespasses and sin, he has given life. All of us, even though we're physically alive, are dead spiritually. We're separated from God. And one day we will die physically. And then it says in Revelation, for those who die physically without Christ, they will face the second death, separation from God eternally in hell. But those of us who trust in Christ, God has abolished death for us. What an incredible message. So since we have such a great message, how can we keep it for ourselves? Just like Judy had to go out and bark and, and tell everyone, you're free. You no longer have to worry about being beaten or starved. You're free. And she couldn't hold it in anymore. How much more we who have the message of salvation should share it with others. And if there's anyone here today that doesn't know if they are saved, that doesn't know if they're right with God and would like to hear more, please come talk to me. Talk to Brother Kinnicott. Talk to one of us. And we would love to share with you from God's word, how you can have hope, forgiveness, purpose, and life. Father, thank you so much for your word. We know that without your word, we would have no hope. But thank you for Christ, that your word teaches came and took our place on Calvary. May our lives be all about him and his message of salvation. Once again, I pray that if there's anyone here today that does not know you, you might work in their hearts and draw them to yourself this morning. And for those of us that do know you, may we be more faithful in taking advantage of opportunities to share this greatest message with those around us. We pray this in Christ's name. closing hymn this morning, if you turn to Psalm 
476. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanza of I Surrender All. time we hurt ourselves and realized the importance that it had for us for eternity and now we have the joy to share that news with others y'all have a wonderful week thank you so much for being here may the lord bless you and we'll see you next week you're dismissed mm -hmm.